Hi, I'm Mark Dumato. Welcome back to Let's Play uh, Batman Arkham City. We're doing the bonus content now where I'm going to be going over the uh, the character files and the, um, the trophies and audio logs we unlocked. Um, to save time, because there is a lot in this game, uh, if they got a write-up in the last game, we are not going to bother reading it because I've checked, they are pretty much the same. But new characters will get we'll get a read and audio tapes new audio tapes will be listened to first up batman this is what he looks like now this is the new picture for him bruce wayne this is what he looks like now alfred pennyworth oracle robin real name tim drake occupation student based in gotham city eyes blue hair black height five foot ten weight 170 pounds First appearance, Batman number 436, August 1989. Young Tim Drake was in the audience the night the Flying Graysons were murdered, where he witnessed Batman leap to the scene. Inspired by Batman's heroics, Tim closely followed the chronicles of Batman and Robin. Eventually deducing their secret identities using his self-taught detective still skills, Tim convinced Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, now Nightwing, that a new Robin was needed in the never-ending battle for justice. Tested by the Dark Knight himself with a grueling training regimen, Tim earned the right to become Robin and has since lived up to the name. Keen detective skills, trained to, f by bat to fight crime by Batman, arsenal of gadgets, and advanced technology. Jim Gordon, much the same as before. Mr. Freeze, same as before. Same as before. Same as before. Audio tape time, though. Prisoner's here, sir. Very good. Send him in. But we haven't got the suit off him yet. He's dangerous. Are you sure? Of course. Victor Fries and I have much in common. We will be fine. Welcome to my facility. Please... Take a seat. I prefer to stand. Why am I here? Oh, Victor, there will be plenty of time for that later. Right now, I wish to get to know you. Discover how you came to have such a frosty outlook on life. I have nothing to say to you. You may have taken my weapons, but my suit still has considerable offensive capabilities. I will freeze the marrow in your legs. Each bone will shatter and fracture while you remain completely aware of your impending paralysis, begging me to end you. I don't think that you will do that, Victor. Really? Why not? Simple. If you hurt me, your wife will die. Where is she? Where is my wife? Nora is in safe hands. Now, let's discuss an incident from your childhood. No. Then this is over. Guard. Wait. What do you wish to learn? Your early years were troubled. I was not a sociable child, but that is all. Even your parents disowned you. They sent you away to a reform school, correct? They did not understand my work. Your work? According to a police report, you froze over a dozen of your neighbor's pets. I have always had an interest in cryonic preservation. I didn't understand why my parents allowed our sick pets to die instead of attempting to save them. So I set about finding my own way. I intended to revive all of those creatures. But you didn't. Which brings us to Nora. Have you ever seen a flower die? Watched something that was once so beautiful, so full of life, collapse and rot from within? You refer to Nora's illness. It seems like yesterday when I first found her. It all happened so quickly. Suddenly, I was losing her. Did you see Kent? What about your employer, Gothcorp? 
I hid it from them, diverting resources from Darth Corp's research in an attempt to find the cure. But in the end, I failed. Time was running out. I knew that if I was discovered, Nora would die. Why take that risk? Do you know what it is to love someone? To really love them? No. Nora was all I could think of. I reran the diagnostics, re-examined every detail from every angle, certain that I had missed something. I cursed myself for being so blind, so stupid. Surely there was a cure. I just needed more time. Then I realized what I had to do. I had worked without sleep for a week. My needs didn't seem important. Sleep didn't matter. Food didn't matter. There was only her. I looked at Nora and I told her that I loved her. She told me there was nothing I could do. That I, we, should just accept fate. She smiled her beautiful smile as she said it. I promised to cure her. And then I pressed the button. You cryogenically froze her, keeping her on ice, so to speak, while you worked on a cure. It broke your heart, but now you had all the time in the world. Did you feel relieved? I went home and fell into a deep sleep. For the first time since we discovered Nora's illness, I dared to dream. But for weeks I had ignored my superior's attempts to contact me. The next morning, I overslept. And by the time I got to the lab, Ferris Boyle, the CEO, was there waiting. What did he do? He accused me of industrial espionage, which I denied. But then his guards found Nora. Boyle told me that, like all of my research, she belonged to him. I was enraged. I attacked him. His guards beat me back, and in the struggle, I was drenched by the cryogenic chemical I had created. I lay on the floor, helpless, watching the guards steal Nora away. Boyle told me it was a tragedy for such a promising mind to perish in a lab accident. Then he left me to die. But you survived. The chemicals were absorbed into my body and transformed my metabolism. My body went numb. I felt a strange tingling, then searing pain all over. Each breath ignited my lungs. I clawed my way back to a refrigeration unit, and as I closed the door behind me, I felt the icy chill calm my aching body. Things suddenly seemed clear. What seemed clear? Finding a cure for Nora? No. Revenge. Boyle would pay. You failed to kill Ferris Boyle, though, didn't you? Yes. Why? You know why. Batman. Though he did return Nora to safety. Until you got her. See? There you go. Blame me... Blame your parents because you failed to revive the neighbor's pets. Blame Ferris Boyle for spoiling your plans to cure Nora. Blame Batman for stopping your revenge against Boyle. And now your Nora is in danger. Because of you. No, Victor. Because of you. You have always had a heart of ice. You stole people's pets. You stole Gothcorp resources. And since then, you've stolen so much more for your own selfish scientific inquiries. If you had shared your genius with others, devoted your energy to medicine instead of crime, perhaps your ice princess would be at home now, preparing you a hot meal instead of being delivered to the Joker. No! You could have saved Nora a long time ago, Victor. It's all for her. Everything. I will get her back. And when I do, I'm coming for you. Thank you. We are done now. Nora. 
Yeah, Hugo Strange is a fucking dick. Wow. Penguin! Okay, that's all the same. Penguin seems to be prospering within Arkham City as the leader of its emerging black market. All the same. Time for audio tapes! I'm only doing this as a courtesy, Strange. Don't think you've beaten me. I just thought we could both benefit from a little talk, Mr. Cobblepot. Don't try that psycho mumbo jumbo with me, Strange. I'm not like the other crazies. Of course not. After all, considering the challenges you faced. Challenges? What freaking challenges? You're no better than me. No one is. I own this place. Well, to be clear, I allow you certain freedoms, but let's continue. Why do you feel the need to own anything? I believe it is a mechanism to compensate for some childhood inadequacy. You were friends with the Waynes, correct? I was. Till someone did the world a favor and blew the brains out of little Wayne's self-righteous parents. I was laughing for weeks. It still brings a smile to my face. And you think that's okay? Okay? No, I don't think it's okay. I think it's bloody hysterical! <laughs> that family destroyed mine. What happened to them? Well, it couldn't have happened to nicer people. Take a seat, Mr. Cobblepot. What is it now, Strange? I wanted to talk about your apparent hatred of the Waynes. Your outburst last time was most interesting. Oh, it's simple, really. I don't like this sniveling little bastard. Look at him. All high and mighty because someone killed Mummy and Daddy. Most people look upon him with sympathy. No, they don't. They're jealous. Jealous of his money, his cars, his women. He lost the sympathy vote when he vanished for all those years. I can't tell you how much I hoped he was visiting his dear mum and dad. Where do you suppose he went? How am I supposed to know? Let us move on, then. No. It's time that you do something for me. And what is that? Here's a list. Told you, Strange. No more little questions until you give me what I want. Take a look, Mr. Cobblepot. Here is a purchase order for the various firearms you require. I must say, you chose an exotic selection. I only take the best. A wise strategy. So what's yours? Excuse me? What are you up to? Why would you give me, me of all people, guns, explosives, all this stuff? Arkham City is an experiment, Mr. Cobblepot. A new way of thinking. We've separated you from society, so I am more than willing to study the results if you all just decide to kill each other. Besides, your feud with the Joker is intriguing. I was here first. I bought my museum in the Iceberg Lounge, fair and square. It was you and that mayo who stuck us all together. Again, you refer to owning things. Quite fascinating. I believe we gave you the opportunity to leave. And take over my turf. Never. Good evening, Mr. Cobblepot. I trust you received the second delivery. <laughs> yeah, I did. I don't know what you did to those dribbling monkeys, Strange, but they were perfect. I'm glad. It appears that we can both help each other. If you say so. I suppose it doesn't hurt that by the time I'm done with them, they're usually in too many pieces for anyone to know what you're really getting up to in those rooms of yours. I have no idea what you are talking about. Of course not. So, Hugo. The clown. She really died. It appears so. Self-inflicted, of course, but yes, he is. He has Mr. Freeze working on a potential cure, but I am sure neither of us want him to get his hands on it, do we? We're ready. Good. Now, one last thing. Your face. It's beautiful, isn't it? The eye. 
I believe it was the result of a bar brawl, correct? Ah, Torag got lucky. He got his, though. He took my eye. I took both of his. Left him trying to walk across the Gotham Freeway at rush hour. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> You're a rich man, Mr. Cobblepot. You could have had that glass removed. They said it was impossible. And what the hell? I think it gives me a more unique look. Know what I mean? Now, where is Freeze? He's right here, in the room next door. You can take him with you. Are you familiar with the term Napoleon Complex? No. What is it? <laughs> it's nothing. Oh, and one last thing. Here is a list of ten prisoners I believe work for you. Yeah? So what? You want to saw their heads open and scoop out their brains too? No. I just thought you'd like to know that they are all in the employ of the GCPD. What? I believe you know what to do with them. I don't like being spied on, Mr. Cobblepot. Good night. Seems Hugo Strange is behind a lot of stuff. Hugo Strange. Hin infamous psychiatrist Hugo Strange claims to have a unique insight on the criminal minds from years of criminal study. He persuaded Gotham Mayor Sharp that the Arkham City Project was the only way for Gotham City to eliminate crime and rogue vigilantes like Batman. Rumors persist of Strange performing ethically dubious experiments on inmates without consent, but unless hard proof comes to light, the Gotham public is happy to credit Strange with a dramatically reduced crime rate. Strange knows that Batman will hunt him down. He's counting on it. Trained to physical perfection, brilliant uh, plagued by schizophrenic episodes. We've already heard the tape, and it's boring. Harley Quinn. Since Joker's Titan overdose in Arkham Asylum, Harley's mind has further deteriorated. She's blindly determined to put a smile back in his face. The Joker! Metro Darkham City. I I um Eyewitnesses claim he is stricken with a serious disease possibly caused by his Titan overdose on Arkham Island. He has been lying low, delivering orders to Harley Quinn so no one can confirm if the Joker is actually in poor health or playing another sick joke. Uses a Yeah, we got all that last time. Now we're gonna this is gonna be long because we're gonna go through all five calls and all five tips. Woo! I can't believe I didn't think of this earlier. A hotline straight to my bestest friend in the world. Just think, I can call you up whenever I get bored. <laughs> I think our relationship is really maturing here. The next thing you know is we'll be exchanging emails or meeting up for romantic dinners. You have one missed call. Ring, ring. I was just remembering when it first occurred to me. It was about six months after you left me on that rooftop back at the asylum. As the bones knitted back together, I had plenty of time to think. So how do you keep a secret from the world's greatest detective? Well, do you know? It's easy. You stick it right in front of him, right under his long, pointy nose. And wait! <laughs> I hope you're doing your best here, Bats, because I just had a horrible thought. We could both actually die here tonight. Fortunately, the odds are weighted in my favor, but just imagine how you'll feel if I'm gone. It's not like you're not lonely enough, right? All that brooding is not good for you, you know. Do you have someone to go home to each morning? And I don't mean that kid you drag across the rooftops. <laughs> I mean someone real, someone you can talk to. I don't think you do. It's sad, isn't it? You do all this for Gotham, and the only person you can rely on is me. You have one missed call. Hey, been missing you. Get back to me. 
Laters! You have one missed call. Hello? I'm not sure that you got my call earlier. I'm just dying to speak to you. Call me, bats! <coughs> you have one missed call. Bats? Seriously? You're making me paranoid. Why aren't you answering my calls? <laughs> you haven't gone and died on me, have you? <laughs> you have one missed call. Look, I know you're not dead. I'm missing a group of my guys down under the tower. <laughs> Guess that means you know about the guns already. <laughs> okay, I admit it, they're mine. Strange gives them to me, okay? Can we be BFFs again? You have one missed call. Ugh, maybe it wasn't you that took out my guys. All right, then. The message I left before, you know, the one I left about the guns, you can ignore it. Just delete it. You have one missed call. Right. This is getting ridiculous. I've been leaving messages all night and you still haven't got back to me. Who do I need to kill to make a pickup? You have one missed call. At last. Hey, bats. Where you been? I was just calling to find out how you're feeling. Are you getting the hallucinations yet? Mm, I know. <laughs> it's hard to tell these days. You just never can tell if it's Scarecrow again, that little guy with the hat, my blood running through your veins, or if after all this time, you really are actually going crazy. You have one missed call. Hey, Bats, are you okay? I'm sorry I had Harley steal your cure. You were so busy with Freeze that she didn't even have time to ask. But don't worry, as soon as that little minx is back here and I've had my share, I'll save some for you. You'll have to work for it, but it will be right here waiting for you. You probably won't believe this, but I don't really think I can sit back and watch you die. <laughs> it's selfish, really, but we need each other. Life would be so boring without you. Who would I talk to? Who would really understand me? Hello? Anyone in there? No sense of humor. Ah, the strong and silent type, eh? Think you're safe behind that mask? Give me 20 minutes in a can opener, and I'll have you whimpering like a schoolgirl. You might like it. That's enough, patient. Guard, leave us. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Professor Hugo Strange. And you are... Two-Face. Catwoman. <laughs> Batman! We can play these games as long as you like. Great! I love games. Not in my facility, you won't. I'm offering you this opportunity to make a deal. I am fully aware of your condition. The last thing you have is time. But I can make your final days more comfortable. And in return, I'd be giving you... Uh... I wish to study you. I need to know why you are the way you are. <laughs> I don't have long, Doc. You're going to need more than some psycho mumbo-jumbo to get to the bottom of what's wrong with me. Oh, I have more than that. Much more. So, do we have a deal? How are you feeling today? You promised me another doctor, Strange. Maybe you shouldn't have killed the one I sent last week. What made you do it? Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. Besides, it was worth it to see the look on her face. Hey, you know what? I think I've got a piece of it here in my pocket. You are trying my patience. That was the third doctor you've killed. Well, keep on sending them, Doc. I'm trying to break my record. I think it is time for you to do something for me. <laughs> Name it, Doc. Tell me how you came to be. Explain what made you what you are today. How you come to be sitting across the table from me. Dying. Is that all? Well, I guess you could say I once had a very bad day. 
Really? Go on. It was a Thursday night. Things had been getting worse. I was three days from the bank, foreclosing on my home. The chemical plant I worked nights at was about to lay off half the workforce. And I was sitting in the hospital, holding the hand of my pregnant wife, wishing to God that she wasn't dead. That must have been upsetting for you. Probably was. Back then, though, all I knew was that if I didn't let old man Falcone's men into the plant that night, they'd have killed me, too. So here's the thing. I had to decide. Could I live without her? Was there any point going on? I've got to admit it. I was scared. Not of being dead, you understand. No one would blame you if you were. It is perfectly common. Do I look common? No. I was scared of the part just before you die, when you don't know what is about to happen, when you're desperately clutching at life and trying to hold on with slippery, blood-covered hands. So I made a decision right there. And what was that? That? Well, that... <coughs> is a story for another day, strange. I think I may need to see a doctor. Get me one. You were telling me about the night your wife died. Oh, no, Hugo. As I recall, I was waiting for you to send me another doctor. We both know I have sent you three more doctors. Did you? Yes. One was left dismembered outside the elevator to my office. The other two have not been seen since they were sent to you. How careless. Listen, Doc. Professor. Okay, Professor. I'll give you a little more. I just hope you're taking notes. It's the day after, and I'm standing in the freezing rain, just staring at the chemical plant, feeling numb. Jeannie was dead. It didn't seem real. I can remember the day I first met her, her infectious smile as I told her bad joke after bad joke, how even after living with the pathetic wretch I was, she still wanted my child. And then they arrived. <laughs> Reality's way of yanking me another wedgie. Falcone's men told me to cheer up. He said, things could be worse. I asked him how. He grabbed me by the collar, pulled me close. He'd been eating garlic, and each word stank as he threatened to perform oral surgery on me with a nail and a brick. A creative guy. They hand me a box. I remember thinking it was heavy. Was it a bomb? A gun? I'd never used a gun before. Were they that heavy? And what was in the box? How's that doctor coming along? I'll get you one. And when you do, I'll tell you the rest. You are looking a little better, yes. Well, I have my good days and bad days, but I do try and start each one with a smile. <laughs> are you ready to continue your story? No, yeah, why not? So where was I? The box. Ah, yes, the box. <laughs> so there I was, tearing open this box, expecting the worst. And all it had in it was a crazy red dome and a cloak. <laughs> ah, I thought they were having a joke with me, but oh, no. They made me put it on. They said it was a disguise. It would keep me safe. It smelled like garlic. And that was it, really. I was dressed up like a spaceman, barely able to see, trying to break into the one place in this town that had given me a job. Have you ever tried to walk with an enormous fishbowl on your head? Don't answer that. It's hard. I couldn't see where I was going. I must have tripped one of the alarms. I heard muffled gunfire. I panicked and tried to run. And then I saw him. Who? That man. Really? Yes, really. Batman tried to hit me. I moved out of the way, but, well, what you need to understand is I had this giant bowl on my head, and I lost my balance. It's like life, really. One minute everything's bad, 
The next, your wife's dead and you're hanging on for dear life, suspended over a tank of experimental chemicals. I'm sure he'd say he tried to save me, but we all know he didn't. I fell for a second, just as I hit the surface. I thought I may just get away with this. I assume that wasn't the case. Do I look like I got away with it? I was drowning. The chemicals were burning my skin. My entire body felt like it was on fire. And it was all his fault. Whose fault? Batman's? Who else? Yours. Come again? Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that you have fabricated a series of events that you use to conceal the truth about your condition. I have read 12 different accounts of your past, all different except for one detail. Batman. What can I say? I like to keep things interesting. A wise man once told me that if you have to have an origin story, you're better off making it multiple choice. And never facing up to the truth of what happened. What you did. How you got here. Oh, I know exactly how I got here. A big truck brought me here from Arkham. You remember the asylum, don't you? Of course. Well, good. Because I'd hate to think that I'd fabricated seeing you watching me in my cell all those times. Excuse me? Hugo, you merry maniac. You were obsessed with me. <laughs> you all were trying to get in here. Next thing you'll tell me, it wasn't you who sent old Sharpie over the edge. Nice work, by the way. Thank you. So here's the thing. If you want to make sure that no one else finds out about your past, you should start poking your nose into mine. Oh, and send me another duck, duck. I think I need a second opinion. So, Hugo Strange is behind a lot. Mayor Quincy Sharp. Quincy Sharp was the warden of Arkham Asylum on the night that the Joker broke free 18 months ago. Unknown to most, but discovered by Batman, Sharp suffered from a split personality disorder that had been committing atrocities in Arkham As in the Asylum, believing himself to be the possessed by the spirit of Abadeus Arkham. In reality, he was being influenced by Hugo Strange, who had provided Sharp with, po with powerful mind control drugs that allowed him to manipulate Sharp's behavior enabling him to plant seeds that led to the creation of Arkham City. Hugo Strange used the evidence of the atrocities committed by Sharp as collateral to make sure that what happened, that whatever happened, Sharp must remain loyal to him. Vicky Vale. Investigative journalist, Gotham City. Eyes blue, hair blonde, weight, uh, height 5'7", weight 121. Investigative reporter, Vicky, investigative reporter Vicky Vale got her start the Gotham Gazette, where she quickly rose to fame for her unwavering commitment to rooting out the ugly truths behind, behind, ugly truths behind Gotham's corruption and poverty. Focusing more and more on Batman's feats, Vicky Vale has recently turned her attention to the opening of Arkham City. She will risk life and limb to portray the danger of this prison city possesses to the public. Perhaps overly confident that Batman will be there to catch her when she falls. Two-Face, six feet, 182 pounds, same as last time. Two-Face is thriving in Arkham City, rallying inmates to join his gang using tried-and-true campaign tactics. Let's, uh, let's listen to his audio tapes. Sit down, Mr. Dent. It is Mr. Dent I am talking to, right? Use a real name. Two-Face, if you wish. Please, sit. What is it, Strange? Not happy just arresting us, throwing us in this place? I wish to understand you. I have read the reports, seen the footage, and now I want to hear your side of the story. <laughs> we'll see. I assume that you feel the need to toss your coin in order to decide whether to answer my questions. You ready to find out? Well... Came up bad. Sorry. Not a problem. 
Guard, take Mr. Dent's coin off of him. No! Good. Now let us see what fate has in store for you. I'll kill you for this. Really? Look at your coin. It wants you to tell me about that day in the courtroom. It was painful. Elaborate. I was naive. I thought I could make a difference. Falcone was going to go down for what he had done. But he had other plans. Look at my face. I am. A combination of first, second, and third degree burning. Mm, the scar tissue is quite fascinating. You think? And that is all it took to make you the way you are. Give me my coin. Not yet. What is it, Strange? Are you enjoying this? Not in the slightest. Let's go back further. You were a rising star, a beacon of light for this city, a white knight riding in to save it with a dark knight not far behind. You can leave him out of this. He's wrong. They all are. No one understands the beauty of fate's hand. I'm grateful to Falcone. He gave me a clarity, a purity that few will know. Everything boils down to a simple choice. This way or that way. Good or bad. Do you really believe that? How could I not? Interesting. So all you need is this coin and everything is simple? Give me it. Or what about this coin or this or these? <laughs> What are you doing? Proving a point. Fate didn't make you answer my question. I did. I replaced your coin with my own. See? You answered me because I wanted you to. How is he today? The prisoner has been quiet. Since getting those coins, he has spent most of his time examining them. Good. Hello, Harvey. Are you ready to talk? Leave us. We don't want to talk. Not to you. Please, take a seat. I have one last thing to discuss, and then I will give you something in return. I don't know. I can't decide. It's too confusing. Of course it is. I want to talk about Mr. Wayne. Why? Indulge me. We don't like the guy. Hardly surprising. Did you ever consider that you were alike? A traumatic event created you. An equally traumatic event altered him. He's nothing like us. There's no risk, no danger. It's just money and girls. We should kill him. Maybe you should. Listen to me, Harvey. I am going to give you a simple choice. This is your coin. Is it? Why should I trust you? It was your father's, correct? You know every inch of it. When you close your eyes, you can feel it, can't you? Give me it, please. I want you to understand what I'm about to tell you. You believe that this coin determines the fate of your world. I, however, believe that your condition has always been present. It was there before you were attacked, and it is still there now. You probably had headaches. Your wife found you unpredictable. Scary sometimes. Give us it! I'm going to throw the coin in the air. If you let it fall, I will do whatever I can to cure you. I will help you become the man you used to be. Or... If you grab it, I will let you loose in Arkham City. And I will tell you what Catwoman is doing right this second. I can't decide. You have to... Mm. At this moment, Catwoman is preparing to steal the contents of the safe in your old campaign office. The bitch! We need to stop her! And you may. Goodbye, Mr. Dent. So, Mr. So, what I'm getting is Hugo Strange is behind everything. Rachel Ghoul. Recognize Batman. 
Yeah, I, that's all the same as last time. Talia Al Ghul, on the other hand. <clears throat> Occupation assassin, assassin based in mobile. Eye color green, hair color brown. 5'7", 141 pounds. First appearance in Sector Comics 411, May 1971. The headstrong daughter is... The headstrong daughter of Rachel Al Ghul and an on-again, off-again lover of Bruce Wayne, Talia Al Ghul is second in command of the League of Assassins. A master of hand-to-hand -hand combat and swordplay, Talia has dueled with Batman on several occasions and considers him an honorable opponent. Despite Batman's elusiveness, her attraction to him has only increased, an attraction that her father encourages in his mad quest for a male heir. Talia knows that one day she may be forced to choose between her father and her beloved. Trained in stealth and combat by the League of Assassins, ruthless and brilliant tactician, runs legitimate business empires for the League. Clayface! Real name, Basil Carlo. All the same as last time. All the same as last time. All the same as last time, but they took away his acidic touch. Cool. But yeah, he looks cool. The Riddler. Humiliate, uh, humiliated by Batman and Arkham Island, Nygma is more determined than ever to bring the Cape Crusader to his knees. Let's hear his audio tapes. Do not fret, Mr. Mayor. Everything is under control, I promise you. It's not that I don't trust you, Hugo. It's just... It's just the headaches. The pain. They come all the time now. Continue to take the medication. But it is late, Mr. Mayor. You are tired. You need your sleep. Of course. I need my sleep. You will hang up now. I will hang up now. Imbecile. I couldn't have put it better myself. What? How dare you enter my office? Oh, I'm not in your office. And please don't insult me by attempting to trace this broadcast. You will fail. I take it I am talking to Mr. Edward Nigma. Do you know of any other inmate in your twisted little penitentiary who is ingenious enough to arrange this little chat? Narcissism. A compulsive desire to prove his intellect. And a predilection for riddles. You've read my file. Of course. Good. Then let's get started. How do you attempt to understand what is going on in Arkham City when all of the answers are strange? Good evening, Hugo. I believe it is time for our one-on-one. -on -one. No. It is time for you to stop this and give up. My tiger guards will find you, and when that happens, I will perform the procedure on you myself. Procedure? Oh, you mean what you did to all those poor fools back at the asylum. To be honest, I think you did them a favor. How do you... How do I know that you requested access to all the most forgettable patients and proceeded to melt their brains with the help of that confused milliner? Or did you mean... How do I know that you have been providing the ex-warden with your own special medication? No doubt intended to render his synapses more malleable to your suggestions. Or maybe you are currently wondering if I know about the secret panel in your closet. How it slides back to reveal what you want most. How you sit, wearing that suit, crying into your hands as you question whether you are really worthy. What do you want, Mr. Nigma? Oh, that's easy. I want exactly what you want. And what's that? Batman, dead. Humiliated, but dead. Knock, knock, Professor. Guess who? I grow tired of these insipid games, Mr. Nigma. If you wish to speak to me, my guards will escort you safely to my tower. Please, Hugo. If you're going to set a trap, at least pretend to try harder than that. No traps, Edward. I simply wish to grant you safe passage through Arkham City. I think the time has come for us to meet as equals. You, Strange? My equal? I am the man whose cunning will soon have Batman lying at my feet, bloodied and broken. Really? Then I will pull off his mask and look into his dull, dying eyes. In that last instant, he will know that I have finally beaten him. 
and I will finally know who he really is. My apologies, Edward. I see now we are nowhere near equals. Finally. You see, like me, you are obsessed with the Batman. But unlike me, you don't know who he really is, do you? What? I know you are lying, Strange. There is no way that you could have figured it out. It's some kind of trick. It must be. Oh, I use no tricks, no childish puzzles. I simply created a psychological profile of the man most likely to be the Batman, and then matched it against the most logical candidate. I was right, of course. Well, who is he? Ah, but that would spoil the game for you, wouldn't it? You must tell me. I implore you, Strange. I... Really, Edward, if I could figure it out, it must be child's play for you. But I... I... Interesting. Tell me, Edward, how is the Riddler like a blank dictionary? You're both at a loss for words. Okay, I hate Hugo Strange, but it's really satisfying to see him own the Riddler that way. Solomon Grundy! Real name, Cyrus Gold. Occupation, not available. Based in Slaughter Swamp. Eye color, gray. Hair color, gray. Height varies. Weight varies. First appearance, All-American Comics, number 61, October 1944. Over a century ago, murderer Cyrus Gold sought to escape injustice by hiding in the slaughter swamp where he met a face, fate worse than death. Mysterious forces doom the now immortal, grunty to an endless wrangle of death and rebirth. Robbed of his memories, he adopted the name of a nursery rhyme. Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday, christened on Tuesday, married on Wednesday, took ill thir on Thursday, grew worse on Friday, died on Saturday, buried on Sunday. This is the end of Solomon Grundy. Each reincarnation makes him stronger. Incredible strength and resilience can never truly be killed. Also, great boss fight. One of the best in the game. Catwoman. Same as before. Since the opening of Arkham City, reports of Catwoman's burglaries are down. The Wonderworld rumors have her hunting Two-Face for an unknown reason. Audio tape time. We found the prisoner attempting to break into your office, sir. I see. Leave us. Yes, sir. Well, well, as I live and breathe, Professor Hugo Strange. Your posters really don't do you justice. You really are far more evil-looking in real life. Charmed. Tell me, what do you plan to do, Miss Kyle? I assume that you were attempting to break into my office in order to retrieve your ill-gotten gains. You stole them from me. Hardly. The items were confiscated upon your arrest. Yeah, about that. This holiday camp of yours is quaint and all, Hugo. But I don't think I'll be staying too long. Escape is impossible. A girl loves a challenge. So do I. Tell me, what would you do if I let you go? Attempt to escape? Try and find the confiscated items? Contact the Batman. Why would I contact him? It's his fault I'm in here. Is it? I believe you would have escaped if greed had not got the better of you. He was actually in the process of rescuing you, was he not? I didn't need his help. Or any man's, it appears. Come on. You're going somewhere with this? Spit it out. I've been studying you. I can see. My eyes are up here, by the way. Very amusing. Tell me, what was it like growing up alone, fending for yourself, doing whatever was necessary to stay alive? Please, I'm tearing up here. And Holly, what would you do if I sent my men after her? Touch her and you're dead. Have you calmed down yet? Where is she? That depends on your next answer. If you could save one person tonight, who would it be? Holly? Or the Batman? He can look after himself. Good. Holly is safe for now. Let us talk about Batman. 
What do you think I can tell you that you don't already know? You've been sending your goons after him for months. He said you were studying him. So you speak. Good. You never knew your father, correct? Enough, Strange. This is over. If you say so. Captain, do you have the girl in your sights? Yes, sir. Kill her. No! Are you prepared to talk? I thought so. Keep the girl targeted, Captain. You bastard. Shall we continue? Your father. Did you ever meet him? Never knew the son of a bitch. Unfortunate. He certainly seems to have made an impact on you. The distrust of men, for example. Your relationship with Batman. Would you call it close? Me and the brooding one get along just fine. But you want more. <laughs> But you can't trust men, can you? What? Look, he's spoken for. <sighs> he must be. How else could he resist all this? You are both very similar, aren't you? A shared disregard for the law. A belief that you are doing the right thing. And a similar taste in attire. But beneath the surface, there is a weakness. Like how? You both risk everything for a chance at redemption. You tell yourself it's to help her. He does the same for the boy. It's all just to make his life more complete. To become the father he never knew. You don't know anything about him. And neither do you. He hasn't confided in you because he doesn't trust you. And it hurts, doesn't it? I touched a raw nerve, didn't I? Are you still here? You're hurt because he knows who you are. But you don't know anything about him. Do you love him? No! <laughs> Holly is safe. I have little interest in the life of a teenage delinquent. Unless, of course, she finds herself in my facility. What was all this about, Strange? Do you enjoy making people beg? Not at all. I am only interested in what makes people do what they do. Soon you will not have to worry about the Batman. Steal what you like, do what you must, in a futile attempt to steal his heart. You will fail. You sound pretty sure of yourself. Plans are afoot, Miss Kyle. Soon you may wish to re-evaluate your admiration for him. I will be the one standing over his body. And the world will know that Hugo Strange is better than him. Yeah, whatever. Two-Face has placed what you are looking for in his safe in his old campaign office. He is someone else who cannot let go of his past. I hope that the contents of that safe make you happy. Yeah, he is behind everything. Nora Freeze. Uh, eyes blue, hair blonde, height uh, 5'6", weight 145. First appearance, Batman, Mr. Freeze, 1997. Beautiful Nora Freeze found undying love when she married the shy but brilliant cryogenicist Victor Freeze. After she was struck with a rare disease, Victor used his lab to freeze Nora in a state of suspended animation until he could find a cure. Since then, Nora has been trapped between life and death. Victor became Mr. Freeze, willing to break every law in his desperate search for a means to cure Nora. Abilities gifted dancer, apparently. Zaz, the lamest Batman villain. Since being... Th uh, since being thrown to Arkham City... His whereabouts are unknown, though reports of his rising body counts fit his modus operandi. Let's listen to his audio tapes, even though I think we already have, but let's listen to them all together. Did I ever tell you about my first kill, Batman? No? As I am sure you are aware, my parents were dead and I was rich. So rich I could have Anything I wanted, but of course, all I wanted was them back. I now know that that was impossible, of course, that their 
death served a higher purpose. But back then, I had yet to experience the joy of cold steel cutting through warm flesh. I had no idea how I could save these people from the relentless misery of their existence. You should have stayed that way. Really? Then I'll stop now. Find another telephone, Batman. Goodbye. You made it. I think I will continue my story. I feel the need to talk. To confess, maybe. I was rich and alone. But not for long, of course. I took to gambling. Or maybe it took to me. If only I had been good at it. Ah, I may not be where I am today. As my life spiraled out of control, I desperately formed a plan. A plan to win back my parents' money and be happy again. It didn't work, of course. Plans like that never do. But as I stood outside the iceberg lounge on that hot summer night, I remember feeling something. Hope, maybe. The iceberg lounge was crawling with the disgusting flesh of humanity. You could find anything there. If you had the money, of course. At the beginning, I seemed to be winning. The cards all went my way, and I found myself at the owner's table. For some reason, I thought I would win, that he would play fair. I looked around the table. I saw the people I was against. Card sharks, thugs, princes, and the disgusting midget who ran the place. One by one, they all lost or folded. The chips were piling up, and it was just him and me. They called him the Penguin, <laughs> even back then. He had both eyes, of course. That little accident hadn't happened yet. And both of them were looking at me when I put down my cards. Six of clubs. Six of diamonds. <sighs> he looked scared. He leaned forward, and I could smell the cigar stench on his breath. The six of spades, and finally, the six of hearts. I felt good. And then he started laughing. He belched out smoke, and he put his cards down on the table. Card by card, my heart sank. A three, a four, a five, a six, a damn seven! A straight flush ended me there. I was lost and thrown out into the city to die. Penniless. Can you imagine what it was like, Batman? I was numb. I'd lost everything and I was alone. Crying like a baby staggering through the streets of the city. Until I found the answer that I had been looking for. I stood there on the sprang bridge... Looking out at the sea, I felt the warm breeze on my skin, and it felt right. I looked down and imagined myself falling into the blissful arms of my mother. And then he appeared. He held out the knife and demanded my money. My money! Can you believe it? I looked into his cold, desperate eyes... And I saw something familiar, something inevitable. I saw oblivion. I saw that we are all the same, stuck on a miserable loop that demands salvation. So I gave it to him. Can you imagine the vagrant surprise when I grabbed his knife from his hands? It, it was instinctive. It was beautiful. In one movement, I sliced out his throat and gave him the gift of salvation. It happened so fast, but I felt every joyous sensation. The blood sprayed over my face and I saw what little life was left in his eyes leave. But then it was over. 
I felt lost. Like it had been meaningless. That no one would acknowledge my sacrifice. And then it happened. Without realizing what I was doing, I plunged the knife into my forearm and cut deep. It was incredible. I felt my body elevate to a higher place. It had become a temple to my work. And then we caught and destroyed Victor's ass. Deadshot. Real name, Floyd Lawton. Occupation, mercenary. Based in Gotham City. Eye color blue. Hair color brown. Six foot one, 193 pounds. First appearance, Batman, Batman number, 19, number 59, July 1950. Floyd Lawton is the deadliest gun for hire in the world. He never misses a shot, especially with his pair of silencers mounted 9mm cannons. Deadshot disdains himself as much as, he corrupt, as his corrupt targets. Several prison psychologists even diagnosed him with suicidal tendencies. Batman is the only person who has ever made Deadshot miss, a distinction that puts Dark Knight at the top of Deadshot's hit list. Master Marksman, expert with all firearms and projectiles. Azrael. He's going to be important in the last game. Real name, Michael Lane. Occupation police officer, based in Gotham City. Eye color brown, hair color black. Height 6 foot 2, weight 210 pounds. First appearance, Azrael, Death's Dark Knight, number one, March 2009. Years ago, Michael Lane was a part of the program to create the ultimate crime fighter. Instead, it turned him into an insane criminal. Thwarted by Batman, Michael confessed his sins to a priest of the secret religious sect, the Order of Purity. They recruited Michael to fight evil as their crusader, Azrael, wearing the mystical suit of sorrows and wielding the Sword of Sin. If Michael does not keep his soul pure, the suit of sorrows will destroy him. The Suit of Swords bestows enhanced strength, stamina, and speed. The Sword of Sin burns with the souls of the damned, prone to fits of insanity, military, and police trained tactician. Huh. Not really the Azrael I remember, but whatever. The Mad Hatter. All the same. But all the same. Audio tape time. Patient interview one. Subject's name, Jervis Tetch, a.k.a. the Mad Hatter. Brought to Arkham Asylum by the Batman six months ago. Patient exhibits signs of obsessive compulsion and paranoid schizophrenia. Sit down, Mr. Tetch. But it's not time to sit. I need Alice. Where is my Alice? Please. No time to sit. Not time to chat. I'm searching for Alice and I've lost my head. Guard, restrain Mr. Tetch. Get off me. Get off me. I'm late. I'm running out of time, Alice. Where are you? Alice isn't here yet. Just relax, Jervis. She will be here soon. But, but, I promise. But, 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 now, would you like some tea? Is Alice here yet? No, I'm afraid not. Let us talk while we wait. You and I have much in common, Jervis. Really? Do you know Alice too? Unfortunately not. You and I both share an interest in the mind, do we not? I studied your papers, Jervis. You are quite brilliant. Truly an extraordinary mind. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's all just chemicals and synapses and rabbits and... Oh, where is Alice? You need to focus. Think about your work for a minute. You theorize that there is no such thing as free will, that you can change a man's allegiances, his motives, emotions, all of what we believe makes a man with chemicals. Your formula was really quite brilliant. That's why I used it. Well, how, how did you get it? Did Alice give it to you? <gasps> Wicked girl. Nasty little thing. Is she here yet? Soon, Jervis, soon. Is she? Oh, you told me that Alice would be here. She is, Jervis. 
She's right here. Alice? Alice, come out. Don't pout. Don't make me shout. Alice, come out. Where are you? Take a look at the pictures, Jervis. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Who, who are these people? Look again. Oh, I, 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 I don't know who they are. Oh, please, is Alice here or not? Look at the first picture. Look at the dress she is wearing. Look at the hair. It's Alice, isn't it? No, no, no. It can't be Alice. Alice has nice yellow hair. And isn't covered in blood. I think you know exactly who this is, Mr. Tetch. I think you remember the night you lured Stephanie Williams back to your research lab. How you offered her tea. What happened then? No, no, no. You killed her, didn't you? No. She was no. first. It's okay, Jervis. It's all right to remember. How many Alices were there? I, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, Alice isn't coming, is she? That all depends on how you cooperate. I have a little side project that I'm working on. I could use your help. My help? I can't help. I'll be late. Stay focused, Jervis. This facility is old, tired, full of ghosts. Ghosts? A figure of speech. Do not worry. Arkham Asylum will not exist forever. Its techniques are old. Its mission outdated. I intend to create a new Arkham, an Arkham that will rise phoenix-like from the ashes of this one. Is there a fire? We should get out of here. I have arranged for some documents to be left in your cell. They outline a technique I propose to control the mind of, uh, shall we just say, weaker souls. I cannot do it without rabbits. I need rabbits for my research and tea and... And Alice, I know. I have arranged for a number of test subjects to be at your disposal. They have been here at Arkham for so many years that no one will miss them. Shall we meet again next week? Oh, and I took the liberty of having your hats returned. I assume that will provide all the encouragement you require. Well done, well done. I must say you have outperformed even my wildest expectations. Yes, did you see the people at my tea party? They all behaved themselves. <laughs> yes, they did, Jervis. I am very pleased. I have just one last request to make of you. You must keep it a secret. Can you keep a secret, Jervis? With enough hats, I can stop people remembering secrets. Does that count? It will have to. I need you to pay a visit to Warden Sharp. He needs to come around to my way of thinking. <gasps> to join our tea party? Exactly. I don't want to. Of course you do. How else will you get to play with Alice? What? I have a new assistant for you, Jervis. I had her brought in specially. Look at her. She's just through there. Oh, it's Alice. She's here. No, no, what are you doing? I need to see her. And you can, as soon as you do what I asked. Can I keep her? Of course. She'll be all yours. She's Alice. Okay, Mad Hatter is fucking creepy. <laughs> Hush. Mule name, Thomas Tommy Elliot, Surgeon Serial Killer, Gotham City. Blue, formerly brown, hair, reddish brown, 6'3", 225 pounds, all that's the same. All that's the same. All that is the same. He was a side mission in this and didn't really amount to a whole hell of a lot. Black Mask. Okay. All the same. All the same. Jack Ryder! All the same. Poison Ivy! Her unique brand of eco uh, since her encounter with the Dark Knight on Arkham Island, Ivy has been transferred to Arkham City. 
Taking refuge in a vine-covered stronghold, Ivory would rather keep humanity away than participate in the gang wars in Arkham City. Fair enough. Kill a croc! His whereabouts are unknown since his escape from Arkham Asylum. He's in the sewer. We found him. Bean! Since the events at Arkham Asylum, it's rumored that Bane has turned over a new leaf in an effort to save others from similar addiction. Not in fact true. And Calendar Man. All the same as last time, but with a new picture. And now we will be... Nope. We're going to be going into these stories. And I'll... But uh, before we do that, I'm just going to take... It's going to be the same video. I just... I've been going for a while. Not really doing anything. I just need a little bit of a break. Then we'll start right back up here. Okay. Story time. Arkham City Stories. Let's see what we got. Aaron Cash. Aaron Cash recalled that night back at Arkham Asylum when... Watching from a security monitor, he saw a crinchy, sharp scrawl an elaborate message on the floor of the cell block control room using a rusty nail and blood from his fingertips before forcing his way out of the cell only to disappear into the chaos. He didn't know where, Warden, where Sharp had gone, but he was sure that there was something seriously wrong with the future mayor of Gotham City. With no other career options available and a nagging feeling that the, he had seen Hugo Strange before, he reluctantly accepted the job of running a small medical team charged with providing assistance to any resident of Arkham City who needed it. The Abramovi Abramovici Twins! Part 1 of 2. Andre Abramovici was a respected man in the small Siberian village where he lived with his pregnant wife. When word reached Andre that his wife was in labor, he rushed home, excited to be at her side, but was met only with by the midwife. His wife had not survived the birth. Complications due to the special nature of his newborn sons were to blame. Pushing into the room, he found his twin sons, joined to the shoulders, screaming for their mother. He took the twins and left town. Crying, he stood on a bridge over the freezing cold river and contemplating, contemplated throwing them to their deaths. But he could not do it. Leaving his sons outside the tent of a traveling freak show, Andre returned home to his village, a broken man. The Abramovici twins, two of two. The Joker heard tales of the conjoined Abramovici twins, now, wide, now widely known as Hammer and Sickle, and their reputation for brutality, and he wanted them for himself. Sending Harley on a desperate mission to retrieve them, she passed on the message to the circus owner that her puttin' would pay big for the twins. Of course, the owner refused to sell his headlining act. He promptly vanished, only to be found three months later with a new smile carved on his face. And, of course, one wheel, we fought them... One wielded a hammer, the clown one wielded a hammer, the penguin one wielded a sickle. Both giant versions. Arkham Island sold. <clears throat> Once a decision to create Arkham City had been approved, Mayor Sharp ordered that Arkham Island be put up for sale. In a press conference, he claimed, This is a fantastic revenue opportunity for Gotham City. Although a number of prominent Gotham companies entered bids for the land, the winning team, the winning bid, sorry, came from a previously unknown security company named Tiger. Within weeks of the sale, Tiger was also awarded the contract to police Arkham City and instantly began using the island to launch its fleet of helicopter gunships to patrol the new prison facility. Tiger, Tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, I assume. Blake reference. Arkham City Medical Team. No, that's a pipe organ. <laughs> Cash chose the abandoned church building near the Solomon Wayne Courthouse to situate his medical team. To situate his medical team at. <clears throat> That's a bad sentence. Knowing that Strange was only providing the minimal amount of medical assistance to placate those campaigning against Arkham City, Cash was forced to beg for equipment and additional medical supplies. The first donations came from Bruce Wayne himself, who applied a series of security shutters to keep the people within the building safe, along with cutting-edge body armor and supplies. On hearing about Wayne's donations, Strange was furious and locked down all supply routes between the medical team and the outside world. Because, as we've established, Hugo Strange is a dick. Hugo Strange is storage vault. <clears throat> On the perimeter wall of Arkham City is the Tiger Confiscated Goods Vault. This high-security facility houses all items confiscated from criminals upon their admittance to the prison. 
A special vault is used to protect the equipment and all ill-gotten gains against various super criminals and is guarded 24-7 by a squad of tiger guards. Upon her arrest, Hugo Strange placed all Catwoman's belongings there, and she has vowed to get them back and leave Arkham City for good. Seismic disturbances. Just weeks before Arkham City was due to open for business, the streets and roads in the northeast side of the facility were devastated by a series of unexplained seismic incidents. The large-scale subsidence subsidence up the street left the street level of an entire district submerged underwater. Campaigners opposed Hugo Strange super Campaigners opposed to Hugo Strange's super prison demanded further investigation into the ca- cause of these disturbances, arguing that this was further proof that the area was unfit under basic human- humanitarian grounds. However, Strange vetoed plans for an inquiry on his land he provided his own experts to demonstrate the size, that the seismic activity was a one-off event and maintained that the inmates had given up their rights to any decent standard of living. Compulsor, compulsory Purchase Upon became, becoming mayor, Quincy Sharp presented Gotham City with his plan to create a super prison in the north of the city, claiming that the site was selected because it contained extreme areas of social decay and neglect. When Bruce Wayne spoke out at, a, at the consultation committee hearing, the mayor pointed out that this location was where Wayne's parents had been murdered decades before. The council passed passed the motion to create Arkham City and set about issuing eminent domain seizures, allowing it to purchase all the land within the site's walls. Studying the Bat Hugo Strange's obsession with Bruce Wayne and Batman was unbearable. He needed to know every small detail of how this man functioned and understand perfectly what made him tick, so that he could finally destroy him. Strange manipulated the mayor into allowing squads of Tiger officers to be deployed into Gotham City under the pretense of aiding the police. However, unknown to the poli- people of Gotham, the Tiger guards had only one target, the Batman. Strange knew his men would initially fail, but he studied every defeat meticulously, analyzing the techniques and strategies of his opponent of his opponent. It would only be a matter of time before he had the necessary data to defeat the bat. Open for business. Mayor Quincy Sharp looked proud as he addressed Gotham on the night that Arkham City officially opened for business. As he introduced Hugo Strange to the mass of journalists, he felt sure that the hard work and sacrifices had been worth it. He could hardly believe that he had achieved so much in the 18 months since the events on Arkham Island. As the champagne bottle smashed against the wall, Strange whispered to him that he would soon have Catwoman and Two-Face arrested and brought to his prison. Quincy smiled. With Arkham City's construction complete, he was guaranteed the approval of of the city, and with all the supervillains in his custody, their next target would be Batman, the person he blamed for everything. Bane. After being hit by the Batmobile and knocked into the dark waters surrounding Arkham Island, Bane swam to shore but was quickly recaptured and taken back to the asylum. Weakened by his injuries and the experiments performed upon him by Dr. Young, he patiently waited, plotting his revenge. Forced into keeping a low profile as he recovered, Bane searched Arkham City for a suitable location to act as a hideout and found just what he needed in the form of the Crank Toys building. There, surrounded by toys, he waited, recuperating until the time was right to make his move. (coughs) Titan on the streets. Having no love for his fellow prisoners in Arkham City, Bane set up and presided over an underground fighting contest where inmates fought in vain for the privilege of trying to take him down. Word of these fights spread throughout Arkham, and the Joker sent Bane a little surprise. As Bane moved in for the kill, the Joker's henchman triggered a Titan injection that ripped through his body, transforming him into a monstrous Titan. Barely surviving the fight, Bane had a new problem. Somehow, Titan had found its way into Arkham City, and it was up to him to stop it from falling into the wrong hands. Black Mask. Roman Sionis, aka Black Mask, is the first and only inmate to have escaped from Arkham City. Using explosives stolen from the Penguin, he waited until the Tiger shift change, blasted his way through the containment wall, and went on the run in Gotham City. Furious, Hugo Strange ordered his Tiger operatives onto the streets to focus all their attention on finding Black Mask, who has who was finally recaptured after a violent siege at the meatpacking plant he owned. Promising that no one else would ever escape again, Strange fitted a series of automated machine guns to the walls of Arkham City, designed to kill anyone else who dared to try. 
So Black Mask is at large, and also will be a major feature in the next game, which technically happened way before this. Close Arkham City. As Hugo Strange was revealed as the public face of Arkham City, Batman attempted to uncover any information he could about the history of the mysterious figure. Convinced that nothing in Arkham City was what it seemed to be, Batman dug deeper and deeper, but came up blank. It was a it was as if all evidence of Strange had been wiped clean. One thing was certain, however. Strange could not have done this alone. Batman was determined to ensure that the site of his parents' death would not become a monument to Gotham's failure and dedicated himself to shutting down Arkham City. Calendar Man Julian Day, a.k.a. Calendar Man, had been locked in the cell in Arkham Asylum for a full year when he was moved to Arkham City. Unable to celebrate the passing holidays in his own imitable style, he could do nothing more than just imagine what he would have done if he were free. In Arkham City, he quickly found the Solomon Wayne Courthouse and claimed it as his own. Anyone who dared to come in was overpowered and taken to a cell where they remained until the next holiday, when day, when day would kill them. It was all going well until Two-Face arrived with a small army and took the courthouse for himself, locking Day up in a cell. Clayface Basil Carlo, a.k.a. Clayface, used his ability to mimic the exact appearance of anyone to impersonate Quincy Sharp and escape from Arkham Asylum. On the run in Gotham City, Clayface had been forced to constantly change his appearance in order to stay one step ahead of Hugo Strange's guards. His current whereabouts are unknown. He was the Joker, and then we punched him in the face really hard. No, we threw a freeze grenade at him and then cut him into pieces. The Falcone family! The Falcones are America's oldest surviving crime family. Generation after generation has ruled the underworld with iron fists, preferring to stay away from the more colorful supervillain activities. They maintain a legitimate business interests, including garbage collection and shipping companies. The current head of the family, Carmine the Roman Falcone, is feared by all and until recently had the city in his pocket. But something has changed. Quincy Sharp, the newly elected mayor, and a man who should be afraid of him was not. Carmine's attempts to intimidate Sharp had resulted in his henchmen being henchmen mysteriously disappearing. And Sharp has struck back with the Tiger Guards closing down Falcone's operations all over the city. A family business. As Hugo Strange's Tiger Guards grip on the city Titan, Falcone family, a, Falcone, a Falcone family meeting was called. The choice was simple. Stay in Gotham and face arrest and imprisonment in Arkham City or leave. The younger members of the family argued that the Falcones run from no one. But in the end, it was the Romans' decision. The next day, the entire family packed up and left Gotham, heading to the relative safety of Bloodhaven. A sick plan! One of three. After Batman stopped him from escaping Arkham Asylum, the Joker sat alone in a padding se padded cell knowing something was wrong. The first sign was an unusual lump on his shoulder. He felt... tainted. Wigs went by, and more unusual lumps appeared. The Titan had done something to him. Something bad. Something that wasn't funny at all. Sick plan, two of three. The Joker was dying. He knew it, and soon so would anyone who saw him. The last thing he needed was to appear weak before his rivals. So one day at lunch, Joker took a spoon and dug out another inmate's eyes, knowing this would get him solitary confinement. He could keep out of sight, at least, until he until his transfer to Arkham City. The Joker needed an escape plan, and on the night of his transfer, Harley Quinn provided one. Disguised as an Arkham guard, she overpowered the Joker's escorts and stole her puddin' away to a boat waiting on the island's quayside. Sick plan, three of three. As the boat carrying the twisted pair sped off towards Gotham, it was joined by a second. A secret alarm planted by Batman had alerted him to the Joker's escape. And there he was in the Batboat, pursuing the fugitives. They ignored his orders to stop, so Batman opened fire. As Harley seared the boat to shore, missiles ripped the hull to pieces. They swam, the weakened Joker being pulled through the water by a distraught Harley, desperate to save her puddin'. She pulled the Joker out of the water to safety, somehow avoiding Batman's searchlight. She and the Joker sat there, gasping for breath, when they suddenly realized they, where they were. Arkham City. Strange goings on. Working at Arkham Asylum, Professor Hugo Strange used a series of complicated psychological profiling techniques to identify the man behind Batman's mask as Bruce Wayne. 
Planning to become both rich and famous, he plotted to sell the secret of Batman's identity to the highest better. Word spread through the criminal underworld that Batman's greatest secret was for sale, but before anyone could act on it, Hugo Strange vanished. Hugo Strange's experiments. Now in charge of Arkham City, Strange continues his radical experiments into the workings of the human mind. During processing, Strange, pers Strange personality, hmm, Strange personally selects inmates that fit his criteria and has them taken away to his inmate behavioral analysis unit. BAU, apparently. No one knows what happens to the missing prisoners in that room except Strange himself. Sometimes they merge lobo lobotomized to roam the streets, but more often they are never heard of from again. Some people believe that Strange brainwashes the missing thugs and turns them into tiger guards, whereas others believe he has a deal with the penguin and hands them over to use his target practice. Which might be, actually might be true. <coughs> Gordon versus Sharp, one of two. As the plans for Arkham City become more public knowledge, became more public knowledge, sorry, Commissioner Gordon, incensed at not having been consulted over Mayor Sharp's decision, attempted to block construction with a court order. He failed. The commissioner called on Batman and explained that he suspected corruption at the highest levels of Sharp's administration. Gordon vs. Sharp, two of two. After losing his case against Mayor Sharp, Gordon was summoned to City Hall. Sharp tried to reason with Gordon, explaining that Arkham City would be something they could both be proud of, but Gordon held his ground. Sharp calmly stated that he understood Gordon's position and expected Gordon to quietly resign. Furious, Gordon stormed out. He might have resigned if he hadn't been talked out of it by Batman. Batman suggests attacking Mayor Sharp and Arkham City with a public campaign, headed not by Gordon, but by someone with money and profile needed to win popular support. Someone like Bruce Wayne. Holding grudges, one of three. Soon after his arrival in Gotham City, the Penguin decided to make an impression on the underworld elite with a gala opening for his nightclub, the Iceberg Lounge. He included the notorious Joker, whose appearance would surely impress the crowd. When the Joker arrived, Harley Quinn on his arm and a dainty flower in his lapel, the Penguin was thrilled. He was hosting his sinister foray of the century until a clumsy waitress spilled a drink on the Joker. Oh, no. <laughs> The laughing joker aimed his flower, and an acid spray melted the girl's face. As alarmed patrons fled the scene, a cold, dark rage at the joker curled inside the penguin. Holding grudges, two of three. The joker eagerly returned to the iceberg lounge a few weeks later, but was insulted to find his name was not on the guest list. Willing to overlook this obvious mistake, he shot the doorman on his way in, kicked his feet up, uh, on a, kicked his feet up at a table, and ordered a glass of warm milk. He was pleased when alongside the milk was a summons to the club's VIP section. Led to the back room, past the tank where Ti Tiny the Shark circled, the Joker happily greeted the Penguin, who promptly pushed him out, a door out of a door onto the street. The Penguin squawked out that the club had a new no-clowns policy before slamming the door. Holding grudges, three of three. After arriving in Arkham City, the Joker and Harley Quinn were eager to explore their new stomping ground. Reflecting that years had passed since the Penguin banned the Joker from the club, they sought out the blue neon lights of the Iceberg Lounge. Harley pounded on the door, certain that Cobblepot would let bygones be bygones. The Penguin answered, a hulking guard at his side, and immediately reminded them of his no-clowns policy. He just managed to close the door before the acid from Joker's flower shot out at his face. A killer in the sewers. In order to remove Waylon Jones, a.k.a. Killer Croc, from the sewers below Arkham Asylum, Strange ordered a squad of Tiger Guards to lure him out using body parts from deceased inmates. Although the strategy proved unsuccessful, the team was able to subdue Croc when he emerged from the sewers looking for food once the supply of bodies ran out. Ugh. The Mad Hatter! One of two. Disgusted at the crimes Jervis Tetch committed in the guise of the Mad Hatter, Quincy Sharp decreed that Tetch should never see the outside world again. For months, Tetch was locked in solitary confinement deep in the bowels of Arkham's maximum security wing. Locked up in the dark without his hats, his tea, and most importantly, his Alice. Tetch's mind crumbled. Professor Hugo Strange became fascinated by Tetch's case, taking particular interest in Tetch's mind control experiments. Strange manipulated security procedures, allowing him full access to Tetch behind the warden's back. 
Mad Hatter, two of two. If Hugo Strange's plans are going to work, he'd need a way to control Quincy Sharp. Having worked with Tetch for months, he had refined a preferred psychoactive compound that would make anyone who ingested it more malleable and open to suggestion. The next day, Strange invited Sharp to join for tea at his office in the administration building. And the Moroni family. The Moroni family has long been at war with their arch rivals, the Falcones. In a constant game of one-upmanship, each family has been hurt. Sons and daughters have been killed, businesses, businesses have been burned to the ground, and still it goes on. Determined to win the war once and for all, the Moronis met in their family restaurant and talked into the night. Little did they know that, as they talked, they were surrounded by Carmine and Falcone's men, who opened fire, killing almost everyone within. With their leadership gone, the surviving Moronis have all been incarcerated in Arkham City. Part 2, uh, Set 2, Maxi Zeus. Not every building in Arkham City is in disrepair be was in disrepair before the Mega Prison was constructed. One operating building was the Gotham City Olympus Nightclub, originally owned by Maxi Zeus. Although Maxi disappeared in Arkham Asylum after one too many rounds of electroshock therapy, the club kept running in his absence, leading some to think Maxi hasn't gone far. A cold start, one of two. When Hugo Strange arranged for Nora Freeze to be moved to Arkham City, her husband, Victor Freeze, a.k.a. Mr. Freeze, escaped from his refrigerated containment cell to find her. But Strange was waiting for him, and calmly informed Victor that Nora had been transported for her own safety, and if Victor wished to see her again, he should move quietly into his new home in Arkham City. To motivate Victor further, Strange promised him full access to laboratory facilities in the old Gotham GCPD building now abandoned with the high-tech security walls of Arkham stocked with all the tools required to seek a cure for Nora. A cold start, two of two. Mr. Freeze stood alone in his new laboratory. Everything Strange had promised was true. Everything except his frozen wife, Nora, who was nowhere to be seen. Furious Freeze upgraded his suit's weapon systems, arming himself to force Strange to give him back his wife. Waiting until dark, he marched out of the GCPD, only to be ambushed by a squad of Tiger operatives with orders to take him to Professor Strange. And we know how that went. Illegal Operations <sighs> While in residence at As Arkham Asylum, Hugo Strange experimented on prisoners as part of the process leading to him unlocking the workings of the mind in order to control it. In order to cover up his experiments, he arranged for those poor individuals Individuals to be lobotomized, locking, locked in the cells, and forgotten. It was during these experiments that Strange perfected his ability to place post-hypnotic suggestions in the mind of his victims, a technique he used to guarantee absolute loyalty from his hand-picked tiger guards. After escaping into custody, Joker released the lunatics and allowed them to roam free across Arkham Island in an attempt to stop Batman. The Cobblepot Feud, one of five. Ooh. One of five, Jesus Christ. At the opening of the Cobblepot Towers, Henry Cobblepot, print magnet turned hotelier, opened at his latest, looked at his latest hotel, determined to outclass the also newly opened Grand Wayne Plaza. Desperate to ruin his rival, Judge Solomon Wayne, Henry left in reports that the Gotham prefer, that, that the people of Gotham preferred the restrained splendor of the Wayne Hotel to his own locations. He swore that the Cobblepot Hotels would be the premier destinations of the world. He was wrong, and it cost him both his fortune and his health. On his deathbed, Henry left the remains of his fortune to his son, Stanley Cobblepot. Stanley vowed to, undo, to outdo the Wayne family in their empire, now headed by Alan Wayne. Cobblepot Feud 205 Stanley Cobblepot instigated a very public feud with the Wayne family. As the Wayne business empire extended to include hotels and other public buildings, Stanley was determined to outdo them, pouring more and more money into his fledgling hotel business to the detriment of the newspaper business and his relationship with his son, Oswald. As Stanley's businesses crumbled around him, he sent Oswald to school in England. Feeling abandoned and picked on by his peers for his homely appearance, Oswald skipped class after class, preferring the company of the thieves and scoundrels he met on the streets. By the, time, by the time his father's empire collapsed, Oswald had vanished. The Cobblepot Feud, 3 of 5. 
When the council decided to shut down the Pinky Natural History Museum, they sold the historic structure to the highest bidder. Located in, a, located in a deteriorating part of the city, many investors passed up the opportunity, but for Oswald Cobblepot, this was exactly what he wanted. He purchased the building and established this as his base of operations, converting the attached theme restaurant at the Iceberg Lounge into a high-profile high profile nightclub. To the public, the Iceberg Lounge was a reputable establishment, but below the surface was a den of iniquity, a go place for illicit and illegal wares. The adjacent museum exhibit halls were repurposed as the Penguin's storage facility, housing everything from his torture room, his weapon cache, and his gladiator pit. Illegal fights to the death occurred nightly, with the visitors earning a job on Penguin's with the victors earning a job on Penguin's crew. Cobblepot few, four of five. The Penguin's operation was run on fear and pain. One night, a guest at the Iceberg Lounge was caught cheating at poker. The Penguin tortured the man in full view of everyone. A friend of the man grabbed a beer bottle, smashed it on the table, and attacked, driving the bottle hard into the Penguin's face. As the Penguin screamed, the attacker and his friends were dragged away to a private torture room. Cobblepot was examined by the finest doctors in Gotham City, but the prognosis was always the same. Removing the bottle could be fatal, and that's how he has his monocle in this version, I guess. It's a nice idea, I suppose. Cobblepot feud, five of five. When the Penguin received the eminent domain seizure from City Hall, ordering him to vacate the Iceberg Lounge, he replied with a letter telling Mayor Sharp that no one tells Oswald Cobblepot what to do. He'd bought us properly, legally, and the city could find somewhere else to stick their prison. On the day that the perimeter wall was due to be completed, the GCPD were dispatched with backup from Tiger Cards to forcibly reclaim the building. <laughs> the Penguin ordered his men to fire at the police, killing three veteran officers. With the Penguin's criminal nature no longer in dispute, Mayor Sharp ordered the wall closed, trapping the Penguin and his guard in Arkham City. Poisonous Intent, one of two. Ready to turn over a new leaf, Pamela Isley injected her poison ivy, rejected her poison ivy persona, and opened a small flower shop in the back streets of Gotham. Surrounded by plants, she was content for a while, but society continued to mistreat her babies, and eventually she snapped. A man came to buy flowers for his wife, obviously feeling guilty about having been unfaithful. Pamela smiled and handed over an elaborate bouquet. The plants came to life, rapidly growing onto his screaming face with and piercing his skin with toxic thorns. Pamela laughed. Poison Ivy was back. After being given an overdose of Titan by the Joker, Poison Ivy was left to die in her airtight cell by Warden Sharp, who blamed her for the mass destruction on Arkham Island. As her health declined, she prayed for salvation. It came in the form of a priest who was unknowingly covered in pollen from the trees near his church. As he performed the last rites, Ivy manipulated the pollen into an antidote with that worked in harmony with the unique natural toxins in her blood. And to her amazement, and to the amazement of the priest, she began a full recovery. Furious, Warden Sharp locked her in a biological containment unit and arranged for her to be one of the first criminals sent to Arkham City. Election time! Quincy Sharp claimed to have been instrumental in stopping the riot at Arkham Asylum. Stirring a tide of public admiration, Throughout his mayoral campaign, Sharp repeatedly told voters that he would never allow their safety to be threatened by criminal scum. His victory was assured when he announced that he would create a new high-security prison that would forever separate the good people of Gotham City from the bad. Once elected, his first move was to put the relatively unknown psychiatrist Hugo Strange in charge of the whole facility. The Ratcatcher Otis Flanagan, a.k.a. The Ratcatcher, looked out through the cellar window on the, op on the opening day of Arkham City. He'd kept out of trouble so far, but he would need a plan to survive. Arkham City claimed to be escape-proof, and the Penguin had the illicit goods market sewn up, so Ratcatcher would sell small comforts. Fine soap, breath mints, extra buttons, he sent his rats out to collect such items from the outside world. It worked, business was brisk, and he felt safe until the Penguin came looking for his rival vendor. Flanagan was dragged screaming through the streets of Arkham City, followed by a trail of rats into the museum, never to be seen again. A new Robin! Richard Dick Grayson was the youngest in a family of acrobats known as the Flying Graysons. Their death-defying act was all that kept the circus where they performed in business. 
As the people of Gotham clamored for tickets to the show, the mob came looking for their cut. After the circus owner refused them, the mobsters killed Dick's parents during a packed performance attended by Bruce Wayne. Wanting to protect the devastated orphan, Bruce took Dick under his wing and became his legal guardian, eventually entrusting the boy with his greatest secret. Desperate to help his friend and mentor, Dick trained hard to become Robin patrolling at Batman's side. Now an adult, Dick fights crime on his own as the vigilante called Nightwing. Scarecrow. <clears throat> no one has seen Jonathan Crane, a.k.a. the Scarecrow, since he was attacked by Killer Croc in the sewers below Arkham Asylum. Some say he escaped certain death by dragging what was left of himself onto a tiny container and floating out to sea, while others believe he was eaten by Croc. Undeterred, Batman has spent months searching for Crane, refusing to believe that he is dead. Crane is out there, plotting his revenge on Batman, and then Batman knows Gotham will never truly be safe. Oh, I think Scarecrow is going to be back. Buried on a Sunday, one of two. On a dark and stormy night in the 19th century, a merchant named Cyrus Gold was murdered and dumped in the swamps near the emerging Gotham City. As the body sunk to, to the pit, it was exposed to an unusual chemical in the swamp, which miraculously reanimated the merchant. He set out wandering the streets of old Gotham, unable to remember his name and only able to recite the nursery rhyme Solomon Grundy. Seemingly able to cheat death, the undead man, now called Solomon Grundy, was captured and ruthlessly experimented on. Determined to discover what had brought Grundy back to life, it became apparent that the creature was now immortal due to a combination of the swamp chemicals and the storm that raged on the night of his death. Buried on a Sunday, two of two. As the army moved through the condemned Wonder City searching for stragglers, no one expected what lay in Rachel Ghoul's private medical laboratory. For months, Solomon Grundy had been exposed to the Lazarus chemical, then repeatedly electrocuted. Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, had he had died dozens of times, but each time he was brought back for more. While the soldiers debated what even was, Grundy revived again and killed everyone nearby. Mentally broken by his ordeal, he waited at the lab for the doctors to return and murder him again. Talia's guard. Even though she is a fearsome warrior in her own, way, her own right, as Rachel Ghoul's daughter, Talia is always shadowed by the secretive order of highly trained female protectors known as the Elite Guard. Each individual guard is chosen generations in advance and trained from birth to be the best of the best, easy cap easily capable of holding her own against a hundred men. Brokering deals. Sherman Fine, a.k.a. The Broker, has carved out a lucrative business in Gotham City by being the go-to guy to purchase property. Mainly hired by the criminal underclass, Sherman will find and arrange all the necessary paperwork to ensure that the deal will go untraced while providing exactly what the client needs. In the past, he has purchased rooms on behalf of The Great White Shark, Mr. Zaz, and The Joker. When planning revenge on the Batman, the Riddler took advantage of the broker's services to secure the buildings that would later house his challenges. Scarface, one of two. The original Scarface puppet was carved from the old gallows tree at Blackgate Prison and eventually fell into the hands of meek Arnold Wesker, who disappointed his mafia family by showing more interest in ventriloquism than gunplay. Scarface became an unlikely mob boss in Wesker's hands until Wesker was locked up in Arkham Asylum without his precious puppet. Forced to imp improvise his scrounge up materials for a new Scarface, one left mute upon Wesker's departure from the asylum. When the Joker took over Arkham, he discovered Scarface and locked up and took a liking to the puppet. Scarface quickly received a garish repaint, a new voice, and complete with a demented laugh and a twisted sense of humor. I kind of wish the Arkham games did more with Scarface, personally. Scarface, two of two. When Batman shut down the Joker's ride at Arkham Asylum, it seemed the relationship between the newly demented Scarface puppet and the Clown Prince had ended, until one of the Joker's old henchmen, Muggsy Binks, showed up at the steel mill in Arkham City. He rescued Scarface from the old museum, knowing it would buy him favor with the Joker. And Muggsy was skillful enough to make a dozen more copies, feeling the Joker freeing the Joker to mutilate any puppet that failed to amuse him. After all, another Scarface could quickly be built for him to laugh with, abuse him, and break into pieces. Joker's only re regret, regret is that people aren't so easily toyed with and replaced. Or are they? Catwoman and Two-Face, one of three. As Strange's grip tightened at 
and the gates of Arkham City slammed shut on Gotham's criminals, only three were left at large. Two-Face, Catwoman, and Batman. Catwoman sat in her apartment, debating whether to flee when her phone rang. On the other end, the unmistakable voice of Two-Face. Sorry, kitty cat, but one of us had to go down. Suddenly, tiger guards were at her door. Fleeing, Catwoman fought her way through the guard to the safety of a nearby roof. She could only watch as the guards ransacked her apartment until they found her safe. She read at her claws, but a shadowy figure appeared behind her and a glove and held a glove hand over her mouth until she passed out. <laughs> Catwoman and Two Face, two of three. Catwoman came in the Batmobile came to in the Batmobile as a race to the streets of Gotham. Shangri told Batman that she would not have that he should not have gotten involved. Batman told her to give up her loot and leave town before it was too late. Undeterred, she asked how Batman knew so much about Arkham City. He explained that he had found a secret room in Sharp's office back at Arkham Asylum with detailed plans for the new prison complex. Catwoman thanked him and pressed the emergency eject button on her seat. The Batmobile screeched to a halt, but it was too late. Catwoman had disappeared, and Batman knew exactly where she was headed. Catwoman, Two-Face, three of three. Two-Face was already in the warden's office in Arkham Asylum, photographing the plants of the secret vault in Arkham, out inside Arkham City. As Catwoman burst into the room, Two-Face laughed as he tossed the originals into the fire. Furious, she knocked him to the ground, grabbed the camera, and ran. With seemingly no escape for, I, for, either, for either of them, and the Tiger Guards alerted and closing in fast, Catwoman was suddenly pulled to safety by Batman, leaving Two-Face to be captured. As Catwoman ascended, she opened the camera to reveal her prize, only to find the memory card had vanished. She looked down on Two-Face, who was showing her the card, before calmly swallowing it. Furious, Catwoman sliced through the line and plummeted to the ground, only to be surrounded by Tiger Guards, arrested and taken to Arkham City. Tigers in the City After disagreeing with Commissioner Gordon over the policing of Arkham City, Quincy Sharp announced that the private firm had been commissioned to provide a total, secu total security solution. Tiger. Knowing to everyone, known, unknown to everyone but Hugo Strange, each Tiger operative was profiled and implanted with post-hypnotic suggestions that made them unquestionably loyal to him and him alone. Vicky Vale! When Vicky Vale first interviewed Quincy Sharp, just days after the events at Arkham Asylum, she felt something was wrong. Sharp's latter appearance on the Gotham Nightliner show that she co-hosts confirmed her suspicions. Convinced that Sharp was not the hero he made himself out to be, Vale pressed him for answers and he became confused, struggling with the facts. As she moved in for the journalistic kill, she was shocked when Sharp suddenly regained composure, answering all her questions with authority. It was as if he suddenly spoke with someone else's voice. Whatever was going on, Vale became more determined to uncover the truth. Wonder City, one of three. Over a century ago, the mysterious Rachel Ghoul arrived in Gotham City and met with the Gotham elders. Even then, Gotham was a crime-ridden, lawless place. Rach promised a brighter future for all in exchange for a deed to the north end of the city. The Gothamites laughed at this strange man until he produced more gold than they had ever seen. The deed in hand, Raish began construction of a new city, a utopian vision powered by clean, free energy. With no crime, the future would be bright. And the last brick was laid by the slaves he had shipped in from his homeland. Raish presented the future of Gotham, Wonder City. I knew it had to be Raish. It was obvious. Wonder City, two of three. Mechanical guardians watch over the population of Wonder City, while behind the scenes lawbreakers were removed and executed. Wonder Tower stood above it all, monument to prosperity. But for Raish, the real reason for choosing this location was simple. Beneath the streets, he had located a chemical source that was called that he called Lazarus. Small doses would rejuvenate a person, but Raish believed that with enough power, the Lazarus could be supercharged to defeat any ailment, even death itself. Unknown to all but Raish and his engineers, Wonder Tower is actually a giant lightning rod. When the timer was right, he would test his theory. Wonder City, three of three. Wonder City continued to operate for months before the effect of prolonged exposure to Lazarus chemical became clear. 
It was driving the city's inhabitants insane. When Ra's al Ghul failed to act, the newly formed Gotham, Hall, Gotham City Hall did. Wonder City was declared a public health hazard and quarantined. Troops dragged the screaming citizens out of their homes straight to Arkham Asylum. Ra's al Ghul disappeared. As Gotham City reached into the sky, new neighborhoods were built over Wonder City until the site was all but forgotten. Some years later, Ra's returned in need of his old Lazarus pit. As his forces began the mining process, the streets above collapsed, but Raish forced them to keep digging. Finally, the Payphone Killer. At first, it was just missing people, last seen near payphones, but then the bodies started to appear mutilated and posed. Stories of a payphone killer spread fast. As the sound of ringing phones haunted the streets, Mr. Zess smiled, hiding in a lair he'd purchased from the broker. He monitored, monitored the array of surveillance cameras pointing at each payphone in Arkham City. As each of their victims answered his call, he acted fast, following them, tracking their movements, and then, when the time was right, killing them. It was perfect. He knew one day he would see Batman holding that phone, and then he'd be able to carve his final mark. And now, all that remains is the character trophies. Batman. Azrael. If you want a closer look, you all are going to have to play the game yourself. Mad Hatter Batman, looking very much like the bunny from uh, from Donnie Darko, in my opinion. Frank, I think? Frank the Rabbit? Robin? Bruce Wayne, with his leg shackles and handcuffs and everything. Catwoman. Jim Gordon. Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze Armor. Bane. Who will be in the next game, actually? Black Mask, who never actually appeared in this game, so I don't know why he has a trophy, but he will be in the next one. Clayface, the final boss. Shame we won't be seeing him again. Deadshot. We will definitely be seeing this guy again. Not only in the next game, but also if you've, if you haven't seen uh, Arkham, uh, Batman Assault on Arkham, watch it. He's in it. He's fantastic in it. Go watch that movie. Calendar Man. I guarantee they'll keep making us deal with this motherfucker. As uninteresting as he fucking is. Huh. 
Harley Quinn. Still, nothing can ta tap the uh, animated series costume. Nothing. Hush. I don't know if he's going to become relevant in Arkham Knight. I hope he does, but... But yeah, Hush. I think he has his own movie, Batman Hush, actually. Came out fairly recently a time of recording. I haven't watched it yet. Clayface Joker. There we have Sick Joker. And on the other side we have Not Sick and Clayface Joker. They look like they're doing a Russian dance. It's kind of funny. Hey, 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 hey. Sick Joker. Well, sicker, I guess. Quite unnerving. Kill a croc. I think he's in the next in Arkham Origins too. The Mad Hatter! This disturbing little bastard. <laughs> Zaz. Meh. The Penguin, who I really wish you could see use his umbrellas. Poison Ivy, who didn't really do a whole hell of a lot in this game. She was in, what, two cutscenes with Catwoman? Three, maybe, cutscenes with Catwoman? Raish Al Ghoul. Pretty good design for him. The Riddler. Quite accurately demonstrating me trying to find all this fucking trophies in this fucking game and doing all this fucking puzzles. I don't know where they got this picture of me from. <laughs> Solomon Grundy! It was really a Superman villain, but what the hell. They made him work in this. He was a cool, he was a cool boss fight. Two-Face! Also, we're probably we're gonna get more of him in the last game as well. Uh, no coin in the picture. That's a shame. Doctor Hugo Strange. Halia. Uh, who I'm still kind of bummed out is dead in this series, I have, honestly. The Medical Protection Team. Led by Aaron Cash. The badasses. Doctors. Same people we had to save from the Riddler. They get trophies too, I guess. Political prisoners! We've saved all of them off camera, actually. Forget who this is. Nurse something? I. Medical intern? Kidnap doctor, right. Undercover cops! 
We formed almost a new faction within Arkham. With our help, of course. Jack Ryder. Vicky Vale. Love interest in Batman from 1989, played by Kim Basinger. I like her coat. Uh, the locked one is, by the way, the Batwing. But we do not have the Batwing. And you get it if you do all of the AR challenges, which frankly, I don't care enough to do. Mayor Quincy Sharp. He's Buru's beaten, beaten, and frankly, he deserves it. This whole thing is his fault. Joker Thugs. There's a special armored one, dressed like a fucking nutcracker. There's one of the punchy ones. And then there's one of the... Penguin Thugs. We got a armored up one in stolen Tiger Guard gear. One of the... with a fucking nail bat. Things with fucking Negan. And one of the machine guns. Cool masks they have. Look a little Danish, though. Two Face Thugs. All of them are just punchy, except for that one of the gun. Kind of boring. Two Face didn't really have much of a hold on the city. Half the costume being burned is kind of a good look. Lieutenants. The Abram Abramovici brothers, Hammer and Sickle. One is Jokers, one is Penguins. We have to fight them both. Behaviorally modified inmates that did not ever appear in this game, they were in the last game. Assassin. Talia's personal guard with the uh, throwing knives he never used. Tiger guards. Got two with machine guns and one in armor with a shock stick. He looks like he'd be so fucking annoying to have to take out with that combination of stuff. I'm surprised it never just had um, someone with a shield a shock stick and body armor as like the ultimate enemy. Penguin Titan Thug. Unfortunately, you can see, tell by his legs and arms, he didn't have a. He had an imperfect transformation. Looks a lot bit like Big Time from uh, Batman Beyond. Joker Titan Thug, however, turned out. But that's the perfect Titan Thug transformation. Looks pretty cool in the clown outfit, frankly. I think it's a really cool monster. Joker Penguin Thugs. Um, I don't know what these are. I guess uh, Joker th uh, Penguin Thugs went over to the Joker. Two-Face Penguin Thugs. I guess Penguin Thugs, that went over to Two-Face. Joker Outcasts. I have no goddamn clue what these are. And then this is one of the bonus costumes, animated Batman. I am the knight. Looking like when he appears in the opening. 1970s bat suit. Oh, a really cool pose, actually. Year One Batman. This uh, actually came with the movie Batman Year One based on 
the Frank Miller work. Earth One Batman. I have no idea what this character is or what the basis of him of this look is. I have never heard of Earth One Batman. Dark Knight Returns Batman, a much, much smaller version, physically, of the Frank Miller's, the Batman from Frank Miller's magnum opus, The Dark Knight Returns. You can see there's actually a, a two-part movie of him, which you can probably buy on one DVD. He also featured in the episode Legends of the Dark Knight in the Batman animated series, in the New Adventures. One of the best episodes of the New Adventures after Mad Love. Batman Beyond! Really, does the suit doesn't translate well to a live-action realism and needs to stay in the uh, dark deco cartoony art style to kind of to work, but eh. It was my favorite costume to play in this game. Sinestro Core Batman. I don't know why Bat. I don't know why Bat. When or why or how Batman would join the Sinestro Corps, but apparently he did at one point. I can't believe Batman being a part of a group named after someone who was Batman. Um, but in blackest day and brightest night, no evil shall. Beware your fa fears made into light. Let those who try to stop what's right burn like his power, Sinestro's might. Animated Catwoman. Voiced by, by the way, by Adrian Barbeau. Long Halloween Catwoman looking unpleasantly like one of those ugly hairless cats. Yeah, you know what I mean. Haven't read Long Halloween considering it. Animated Robin. This is an alternate costume for Robin. This is funny because that Robin is Tim Drake. This Robin from the animated series is actually Dick Grayson. So, I mean, Tim Drake was in the animated adventures, but he was like 10, so I don't think he could have translated that well. Red Robin. Um, this character might, this is an al another alternative costume for Robin. Red Robin might be in the uh, in the main universe, Tim Drake, but I know him from uh, Kingdom Come. Really good comic, by the way. I highly recommend it. Where it's um, a future Dick Grayson where he's become Robin again, and he, it, a lot of the art is based on... Um, it's beautiful art by Alex Ross, actually, based on uh, 1989 Batman with... Uh, what, Michael Keaton? It looks like him with the ears filed off. It looks really good. But if he's if Tim Drake's become Robin in the main continuity, became Red Robin in the main continuity, that's cool. I didn't know that. Nightwing. He's only available in challenges in this game. I don't play challenges. He will be playable in Arkham Knight in the DLC. Um. Yeah, but I'm, eh. I, I it looks fine, I guess. These screamer sticks are nice. The emo hair is a little much for me. I prefer the long hair with the ponytail from my That's me. Animated Nightwing. Yep, this is how Nightwing appeared in the animated show, except he had long hair. Uh, still Dick Grayson. Uh, he never used the screamer sticks, though. And lastly, the stuff from Harley Quinn's Revenge, Morning Harley, where she never actually used that sledgehammer, but where she's more goth in her appearance with the veil. Really nice look, I have to admit. Pretty hot. Um, actually, glad we actually get to have Harley Quinn do something. Harley's Thugs. Got one with a knife there, got one in armor with a baseball bat, and got one with a gun. Now, funnily enough, um, this one actually looks 
to me a lot like uh, the first Joker's gang member you see in Batman Begins, uh, the one that Terry fights on the train. And it's also the, the main one in, uh, I think his name is Jack Jekko? I can't remember. The one that, um, kind of like a color reverse version of that, the one who steals the uh, the super plane in, uh, for jo the episode Joyride. Uh, we got Harley's Titan Thug. Looks like he may have begun life as a, as a uh, Joker, a Penguin game member. He hasn't evolved all that well. He has a tattoo of the Harley Quinn symbol. Tiger operative gear. He looks, uh... I mean, he was a fucking bitch to fight. I can, get, I can tell you that much. And then we have Batman Incorporated that suit. With this very ugly crotch plate. I know, something just... At first glance, it looks fine, but the more you look at it, the more about the design just doesn't work. I don't know, it's a really, really hideous bat suit to me. <laughs> I don't know what, what it is, it's just, it's unpleasant to look at. And those are all the character trophies. Don't know what my next game is going to be, but I am going to be starting soon Arkham Origins, and I will see you in the next Let's Play, and also in Arkham Origins when I release that one. Ciao, guys. I am the Knight. Hi. Thanks for watching. This has been played and recorded by me, Merrick D'Amato. The art was by Rafael Agrona. You can find a link to their commission page in the description below. And if you, li if you like this video and want to see more like it, like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and see you all next time. Ciao.